You are listening to Riverhouse Church's Sermon of the Week. We hope this talk equips and inspires you. So I am going to start out by having you all close your eyes. And I want you to think about some of the best moments of your life. Okay, keep your eyes closed. And now I want you to take a minute to decide what day of your life you would want to relive if you only had one day left to live. Okay, open your eyes. It's not an easy thing to do, to figure out what day you would relive, but doesn't it quickly help you to see what's really important in your life, right? It was so fun watching your faces. I saw people smiling all over the room. I saw a tear. I hope it was a happy tear, but it definitely gets us straight to the heart of the matter. Well, we all have a story. By the way, I'm nervous. (laughs) Can I just say that? (laughs) This is a big stage. Gosh. Get used to it. So we all have a story of amazing, incredible moments. But we also have a story of heartbreak and pain and disappointment. And it is so important that we tell our stories for so many reasons. It's important that we tell them because we were created for community. We were created for intimacy. Into me you see. We were created to be known and to know. And in order to do that, we have to tell our stories. And what we find when we tell our stories is that we sometimes think that we're the only one who has suffered this way or the only one who has walked through this. But the truth is, is that we're not. We're all in this thing called life together. And so when we tell our stories, it unites us. It brings us closer. So tonight, I want to share a little bit of my story with you. And I want to start out by telling you a couple years ago, I was having breakfast with a dear friend in Rembrandt's, and as I was sitting there, all of a sudden, this feeling came over me, and it was scary. I had never experienced this feeling before, and I immediately excused myself and raced to the bathroom, uh, but I didn't quite make it, and I collapsed. And I was in so much pain that I couldn't think straight thoughts, and I couldn't speak. So they called the paramedics. Eventually, my friend realized I had been gone a while, and she came and found me. And um, just before they were going to take me away, the pain started to leave. And then I was fine. I was back to myself, but I was scared. And um, I wasn't quite sure what just happened. Uh, But then it was our very first women's conference, Arise Conference, and we literally just opened the doors to let the women in, and here comes that feeling. And I raced to the Kayafit room where I collapsed on the ground. And I was in so much pain. They called Jordan, and he was stressed out. And again, I didn't know what it was, and it continued to happen. I was in my basement. It happened. Luckily, I called Jordan right before. He had to bust a window to get in, and I knew it was time to get help. So I began going to every doctor, taking every step I could take, getting every different test, 
And even though my insurance didn't cover any of it, I knew I had to do this. And the day came when I was finally going to my doctor who had all of my results, and I was gonna find out what was wrong and what I needed to do to get help. When I sat in his office, he basically told me that I had a couple of things, and one of them was a very rare condition, and that there were two different ways of, of taking care of it, but neither one of them would work for me. And so he basically gave me no hope and no direction. And as I was walking out, they handed me another medical bill that I wasn't expecting. I'll tell you what, I got in my Jeep and I broke. I cried so hard. God, like, I need to hear from you. Like, Lord, I need you to step in. I have no plan B. And a couple of weeks later, I received a, an invitation to go to Hawaii with a ministry that just brought in leaders and pastors, and they just blessed them and paid for everything and treated them like royalty. And I knew that that was a gift from God to me, because Hawaii, come on. <laughs> well, because I'd been so sick, the board decided to give me an additional month off to try to, to find what was wrong and to get some healing. And so, you know, I was already gonna be in Hawaii, so I just decided to stay. <laughs> and I rented somebody's little tiny ohana, their little guest house, and I spent the first week with this amazing ministry, but I couldn't wait to get alone with God. And I was so excited. I got in, brought all my luggage in, grabbed my Bible, and I sat down to be with him. But something was wrong. It wasn't what I was expecting. Because what I realized was that my heart was numb. I couldn't feel him. I couldn't hear him. And as I sat there alone in this little place, there was one little desk chair, and I turned it around. And with my imagination, I pictured Jesus sitting in that chair. And I sat down in front of him, and I just said, here I am. I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm not even sure where I'm at right now. But Lord, I'm just going to sit here in front of you, and I'm just going to let you speak to me. I heard nothing, but I, I did it again the next day, and the next, and the next. And uh, he began to open my eyes and show me some important things. One of them is that building this church seemed so easy because there was so much favor and blessing on us. But the truth is, is that it was a lot of work. And so whatever the need was, you just stepped up and you did what you did. For a while, I was the children's pastor, the head of greeting. I was the inner healer. Uh, let's see, what else was I? You name it, I took the title. And, and so what was happening is that I, was, I had a lot to give for a long time. But then I reached a place where I had nothing left to give, and I kept giving. And so I was giving out of a deficit, and it was making me sick. My body was trying to tell me that something was very wrong, but I was going too fast to listen. And I could see that living such a hurried life was not only destroying my health, but it was destroying my intimacy with God. And I knew it was time to change. So as I sat before the Lord day after day, and he began to reveal these different things to me, I journaled, I listened. It mattered. I needed him. And every time I heard from him, he was taking me deeper and deeper into the truth. And I want to tell you, that there was one real truth that I finally got to. And that was, there was a soul, there was a question that my soul needed answers that nothing could answer. I had already tried to find the answer all around me. 
And that question was, do I have what it takes? I mean, look at all you powerful, amazing, incredible people. Do I have what it takes to be a pastor at this church? And I was going so fast because I didn't want to look at that question. Come on, I've been serving God for 40 years. Shouldn't I already know the answer? But I didn't. And that question kept me going really fast and really hard. And it was only one person who could answer that question. And his name was Jesus. And I finally found the answer. Christ in me, the hope of glory. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So the answer is that yes, I have what it takes to be a pastor at this church. But I would have never found that had I not sat at his feet day after day after day until he solidified that I am called to be a pastor at River House. Those who wait upon the Lord will gain a new strength. I came home from Hawaii with a new strength, and it was time to slow down. No more running and rushing to this thing and to the next thing, and then I go to this appointment and that appointment. It's like, no, it's time to slow down. No more pressure to try to be perfect. Because see, because I didn't know the answer to that question, I was trying to prove that I was enough, that I had what it took. And so I was trying to make everything perfect. And it was absolutely wearing me out. I wrote down all the things in a journal that caused me pressure, and it was a big, long list. And I'm going to read you some of them. Whew. Are you ready? Yeah. Eat healthy, drink your aloe and essential oils, and don't forget to make your bone broth. Take your supplements and go to the gym so you stay healthy. Take care of your skin. Get pills, facials. Keep up on all your lotions and potions and creams. You don't want to look old. Take good care of your Jeep. It's the only one you have. Keep everything in tip-top shape so it doesn't break. Change your filters. Clean your fireplace. Trim your trees. Weed and fertilize your yard. You don't want the weeds to take over. <laughs> Read, study, and stand on God's Word so that you stay strong spiritually. Work on your posture. Stretch so you don't get injury. Floss so you don't get cavities. <laughs> Wear sunscreen so you don't get dark spots or worse yet, skin cancer. <laughs> this is real. This is not a joke. This was my life. Oh, no more pressure. I'm done. I came back and said, God, I am ready to completely depend on you for everything. For absolutely, positively, every area and everything in my life. And Justin Ross told me something. He said, Robin, use these words, good enough. It's good enough. Your house is good enough. Your weight is good enough. Oh, good enough. <laughs> right? It is time to have less of everything, less phone calls, less activities, less lotions and potions, <laughs> less, less taking care of this, less. Just give me less so that I can have more, more of him, more peace, more time with my beautiful, amazing children, more time with the people who matter the most, more time just being instead of always doing. And I discovered something. 
that I don't have to damage my body or my soul to get things done. I have the capacity to do absolutely everything that I need to do if I do it out of rest. Or if I don't have the capacity, God will bring somebody to do it for me. Amen? <laughs> Come on, Dad. I'm not joking. He has. I had a cabinet break off in my, in my office, and it sat there for a month. And I'm like, okay, I tried to figure it out myself. I'm just, I don't know how it goes back on. And out of nowhere, I get a text from an amazing godly man. And he just says, hey, is there anything around your house that needs to be fixed or whatever? And I was like, can you come today? <laughs> oh, my goodness, absolutely. <laughs> that cabinet didn't drive me crazy. So he comes, and he fixes my cabinet, and then he says, I want to be your new handyman. He's like, I want to just fix things when you need them fixed. And he's like, and I specialize in sprinklers. <laughs> you specialize in sprinklers? I'm a gardener. This is a gift. And then he said to me, and listen, I don't want cookies and treats and cards and cash. I don't want anything. I just want to come and help you. I'm like, Lord, you're good. No, so then I'm, I have digestive issues, and I'm supposed to drink organic bone broth, but you have to make it, and it's a mess, and it takes two days, and I never have two days to make bone broth, so I rarely ever end up drinking it. I had a beautiful woman show up at my door with a big container of homemade organic bone broth. She brings it to me every week. Come on, that's the God we serve when we depend on him. He says, I will supply your needs according to the riches of my glory, right? If we depend on him completely, he's a good father. So Adam was created on the sixth day, right? What did he do on the seventh day? That was his first day. He... Say it again. He rested. he rested. Therefore, he had a lot on his plate. Come on. But he had the capacity to do it because first, he rested. So that was my message. First, I have to rest. I also discovered that when we rest, it opens a gate that leads us to the greatest desires of our heart. How many of you have gotten a word from Paul Warner? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, does not, he not just bless this church and bless us? Yeah. So a long time ago, he gave me a word, and he basically said, yeah, he goes, I, I got a word from you, and like I saw these big dump trucks, and he goes, they were lined up, and he starts naming them, and they were filled with the desires of my heart. And as he's reading what they are, it's hitting my spirit. And then he said, and I see the Lord tattooing Psalms 37, 4 on you. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He said, the time is now. Well, I want y'all to know that he was right. And I am in a season of being dumped on. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I am not even joking one bit. So, oh, where do I start? I stopped journaling. I can't write it all down anymore. It's just taking up way too much space. <laughs> Can I share some of them with you? So, I have been driving a Jeep for years and years. They're my favorite. And my Jeep was getting, it's over 100,000 miles, trying to decide if I just keep it and drive it till it dies or sell it while I can get something out of it and get something new. And anyway, so I was trying to get a Jeep. Long story short, somebody talked me into giving up on the cool car and just getting like a basic car, right? And I was like, oh, like that is not fun. Like, come on. But I finally gave in, and I was like, all right, Lord, I'll do it. And then, I, it was on a Sunday night, I got home from church, and I was on Facebook, 
and my dream Jeep that I'd looked at probably 10 times and couldn't afford every single time came up on Facebook, and as soon as it did, my heart started pounding, and the Lord said, I want to give you that Jeep. And I was like, well, let's sleep on this, because <laughs> I just yesterday called somebody and told them that I was going to get a practical car. <laughs> let's sleep on this, and we'll see how I feel in the morning. I get it back up. I open it up. As soon as the Jeep pops up, my heart starts pounding, and I said, Lord, you're giving me this Jeep. Okay, so this is on Monday morning. If anybody knows Jordan, you don't talk to him on Monday mornings. <laughs> so I went and found Jordan, and I said, listen, listen. I, I, I know. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to bug you on Monday morning. But Jordan, I said, God's about to give me this, the coolest white Jeep ever. And like, I need your help. <laughs> and he just looks at me like, like, What? Like, I thought you weren't giving them my Jeep. I was like, I know, that was my plan, but God had a different plan. And so, so listen, I'm getting this Jeep, and like, I really need you to help me. He's like, all right. So we drive to this place, and the, it's the manager of the dealership's personal Jeep, so it's got every extra on it. As soon as we pull up, Jordan's like, you can't afford this. <laughs> I said, I know I can't, but he can. You guys, it's too long of a story, but I drove out with my Jeep. <laughs> Riley still says, I can't believe you got that Jeep. Oh, Riley, oops. <laughs> you guys, last December 17th, I got so radically dumped on with, I got seven desires of my heart in one day. It started at seven o'clock in the morning and it en ended at 10 o'clock at night. No, 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 when I got home from work, <laughs> I was, a Jor I was like, Jordan, I have to tell you, like, listen to me. I've got to tell you what has happened to me today. And I started going. He goes, Mom, c c calm down. He was like afraid I was going to have a heart attack or something. And it was because I literally could not contain the joy of seeing what God was doing in my life. Do you remember those medical bills that were piling up? Did you know that I have somebody that called me and I didn't even know them very well? And they said to me, listen, the Lord told me that you have outstanding medical bills that you've been stressed about, and he wants me to pay them off. <laughs> she paid off every single one of them. Listen, that is the God that we serve, the exceeding abundantly beyond God that we serve. I have never known a season like this before. I have been given extravagant gifts. Listen, I just got the most luxurious gift of my life. It was to a med spa. For those of you who don't know what that is, go look it up. Or for those of, the, those of you who do, notice anything different? Just saying. Hey, it was a gift. I wasn't gonna turn that down. Okay, listen to this. My accountant calls me a month ago and he says, Robin, you made a mistake again. <laughs> and I was like, no, I didn't. I did it all right this year. No, actually you didn't. And he's like, you forgot to do this and you are gonna owe $3,700 in taxes. Daddy, I looked straight up. I never even, I never even put an emotion around it. I literally said, Lord, I need you. And I never, I never thought about it again. Like a week and a half ago, my accountant calls me and he says, uh, Robin, uh, this is really strange, but your payroll company did something different and you're getting a credit for $3,700. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, God. And he goes, this is really quite strange because it balances out what you were going to owe. And I said, no, it's not strange. It's God. It's God, the exceeding abundantly beyond God that we serve. And God is blessing my sons, my baby boy who's in college. He is stepping into his anointing. And God has been doing powerful things through his voice. And it blesses this mother's heart. And then y'all know that finally, my oldest son is getting married. <laughs> right? 
Jackie, do you know how long I've been praying for you? <laughs> when I slowed down, stopped trying to do it all on my own, and truly became dependent on him, it made more space for God to come. And when he came, he brought everything he had with him. Amen. Amen. In his presence is fullness of joy. In his right hand, there are pleasures forever. And I know it to be true. Satan called a worldwide convention. In his opening address to his demons, he said, we can't keep the Christians from going to church, from worshiping God. We can't keep them from reading their Bibles and knowing the truth, but we can do something else. We can keep them from hearing the voice of God. So let them go to church, let them have their worship music, let them live their Christian lifestyles, but steal their time so that they can't gain intimacy with Jesus. This is what I want you to do, distract them. How shall we do this? Keep them so busy with the non-essentials of life and invent innumerable schemes to occupy them, he answered. Overstimulate their minds so they cannot hear the still small voice. Entice them to listen to music while they drive, to keep the radio, TV, and Netflix going constantly in their homes. Let them be involved in ministry, but crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek power from the Lord. Soon they will be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family unit for the good of the cause. Do you think that they've succeeded? I read a book called Present Over Perfect. Anybody read that? Mm -hmm. It's a great book. So Shauna, it was by Shauna Nyquist, and she was living the dream. She was, you know, a best-selling author of several books. She was being sought after. She was on the Oprah Winfrey show. And this is what she writes. I was more and more aware that I was actually miserable. Not all the time, of course, but sometimes in those rare moments when I let myself really feel honestly instead of filling in the right answers, I realized with great surprise that this way of living was not making me happy at all. You see, we can have everything that we want. We can be living our dreams, but it doesn't mean that we will be happy. Happiness is an inside job. And we have to slow down to even figure out what's going on on the inside. We need to slow down to figure out why we're going so fast. She goes on to stay, say, I understand the problem. The hustling that had so deeply compromised my heart was an effort to outrun the emptiness and the deep security, insecurity inside of me just like me, right? That was me. I didn't know. I was insecure. I didn't know if I had what it took. And so it took me slowing down. She says, if I push enough, I will feel whole. I will feel proud. I will feel happy. But what I feel, though, is exhausted and resentful. You see, there is a huge cavernous ache inside of every one of us. And we have these questions that our soul needs to have answered, every single one of us. And you know, so often we look for somebody or something or what we do to try to answer those questions. And all it does is leave us in more pain because it always falls short because they don't have answers for us. Am I worthy? Do I matter? Is there truly a plan for my life? And do I have what it takes? Am I lovable? Am I safe? There's such important questions that we ignore and try to outrun. Until we know the answer to these questions, the emptiness and the ache just won't go away. So we keep moving. And most of us learn that if we hustle fast enough, the emptiness and the pain 
will never catch up. So we do, and we do, and we do, and then we're exhausted. And the hustle becomes like a drug. It numbs our pain. It does. I know. But guess what else it numbs? It numbs the good stuff. It numbs joy. It numbs happiness. It numbs gratitude. It numbs intimacy. And guess what happens then? We end up living these boring, mundane, mediocre lives. And we ask ourselves, what's wrong? What's wrong with me? You get on Facebook and you see all these people living this glorious life. Not. But it's so easy to think everybody else found something that you don't have. How many times have you said, I just don't hear the voice of God? I just don't feel passion. I don't laugh. I don't feel joy. Maybe, just maybe, your heart is numb. Everything that we want, everything that we're looking for, is found at one place, and that is at the feet of Jesus. But we have to get out of the fast lane and slow down and take time to sit with him. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. He is the one that has the answers to our soul's questions. Listen, young people, figure it out now. Don't wait until you're my age. <laughs> Sit with him. Let him answer those questions. And he is the one that will calm the ache inside of you. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is our life. You know, it is really scary to slow down and to, and to live without the rush. I mean, it is terrifying. It's completely unprotected, vulnerable. Stare your wounds and insecurity right in the face. Uncomfortable. But that is the very place that we grow. That is the very place that we find the answers that we're looking for. That's the place that our life truly begins to change, right there. And in this place, powerful things happen inside of us. It's like a molecular composition of your soul gets restructured. You start to think differently, act differently, see the world differently, see yourself differently. Your desires begin to change. Your interests begin to change and you don't even know why. You just begin to be transformed. Because when we behold him, we become like him. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It will always be Jesus. He is our everything. He is our savior. He's our friend. He's our comforter. It's Jesus. And the longer you linger in his presence, listening to what he has to say, basking in his love for you, the longer you stay there, it's like you're ingesting him into every fiber of your being. Power begins to take over your life. And every single moment you spend with him is an investment. Every single moment, regardless if you hear from him or if you do not, it is an investment and it is never wasted. Church, we are in a season where God is calling us into the secret place. He is calling us there because he has so much that he wants to say to us. He has so much that he wants to give to us. It is time to crawl into that space with him. And he wants to create this safe place to have this deep, beautiful, intimate relationship with you. 
because it brings euphoria to our lives. We were created for intimacy. And when we are experiencing it, nothing compares to it. Absolutely nothing. He wants to bring you back to life again, just like he did me. He has so much he wants to say, and he is ready to unlock the treasures of heaven for those who commit to spending time in the secret place. Listen, miracles don't always happen when we pray, when we talk to Jesus. Things don't always change. But when he speaks, everything changes. So prayer, power of prayer is found not in convincing God to do what we think is important, but it's listening to what is important to him. Amen? Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 in the message. Are you tired, worn out, burn out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything too heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me. And you'll learn to live freely and lightly. One morning, one early morning, I was just sitting at the feet of the Lord. And what that looks like for me is I, my secret place, I've shared this before. I meet the Lord at, at a garden that opens up to, my, uh, at a gate that opens up to, to a very elaborate garden. And every day there's a big basket at the gate. And the Lord will say to me, what's heavy on your mind? What are you stressed over? What's, what's going on? Put it in the basket. Put it in the basket. So I just sit and think of everything that's, that's on, on me, heavy, and I just put everything in the basket. And then he'll ask me, are you ready to go in? And I say yes, and he'll say, you know, I'll take care of everything in the basket. And so then he takes me in to this beautiful garden where I use my imagination our imagination is one of the greatest gifts that he's given us because we can actually picture his face. You know, so I, we go and we find a place where we sit, someplace in my beautiful garden, and then I will get at his feet, and I'll use my imagination to picture his feet. And sometimes I wash his feet, and sometimes I rub my hand on his wounds, and I just posture myself in a position to when he speaks, I'm not going to miss it. And I try to picture his eyes so that one day he'll be able to answer me with just a glance. Robin, that way, that way. It's like I w I'm so hungry to have such a deep, intimate connection with him that I'm willing to meet him day after glorious day. Even if I hear nothing and see nothing, because a lot of times he doesn't speak. A lot of times it can be very mundane. But it doesn't mean your time is wasted. Amen. Right? So one morning I'm sitting at his feet. And I had been there in the beginning. By the way, in the beginning, when you, if you decide to do this, give yourself so much grace. Because it, I was like two minutes max. And then I would get distracted. And so it's a discipline that you really do have to build up on. So many times I fell asleep and I would wake up and say, oh, I'm still in your presence. Yay me. <laughs> grace, 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 right? But this particular morning, he spoke so clearly to me that it, it wrecked me. And this is what he said. Robin, like Mary... You found the better way. And the reason that I was so wrecked is because I'd been her sister. I was Martha. And I knew in that moment that the Lord has spent the last 40 years trying to get me right here. And I also knew that I would spend the rest of my life right here. Like Mary, 
you found the better way. You know Mary. She was the one that poured out her expensive vial of perfume on the feet of Jesus. And she was the one that was sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha was running around getting everything done. And when Martha complained to Jesus that she wasn't helping Jesus, I love Jesus' reply. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Actually, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Listen to me. Mary didn't care what anybody thought of her. She wanted one thing, and that was Jesus. She was struck breathless by the overwhelming understanding that he was better than anything she had ever experienced in her entire life. She knew that what she had been searching for all of her life was Jesus, and he answered the ache of her heart, and he answered the questions of her soul. And being with him was to have everything she had ever dreamed of. And with him, she became everything she ever wanted to be. And he began to transform her mundane life into an exquisite garden filled with all of the deepest desires of her heart. His name is Jesus it has always been Jesus, and it will always be Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the Bread of Life. He is the indescribable gift. He is the Light of the World. He is the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. His name is Jesus, and he is the way, and he is the life, and he has every single thing that we want or need. It's all about Jesus. And when we establish the discipline of meeting him in the secret place, when we truly depend upon him for every single thing that we need, when we seek him with all of our heart, we find him. And when we find him, we find everything that we have been longing for. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to close with a great garden for us all to grow. And then we'll have the prayer team come up. <sighs> Plant three rows of peace. Peace of mind, peace of heart, and peace of soul. Plant four rows of squash. Squash pressure. Squash anxiety. Squash noise. Squash hurry. Plant three rows of lettuce. <laughs> Let us slow down. <laughs> oh. Let us take a deep breath. And let us sit at the feet of Jesus. No garden should be without turnips. <laughs> <laughs> Turn up for those that you love. <laughs> Turn up for what really matters. Water freely with patience and cultivate with love. There is so much fruit in your garden because you reap what you sow. Yeah. To conclude our garden, we must have time. <laughs> time for God's word, time to pray, and time to rest. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. <laughs> but doggone it, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Amen. Let's pray. Way to go, Robin! <laughs>
<laughs> oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. This is the prayer I've been praying over you all for the last month. I pray that the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what the hope of his calling, what the riches of his glory, of his inheritance, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us. Father, thank you for being here today. Thank you for always showing up, even when you don't have to. Thank you, God, for desiring to be with each one of us. Thank you, God, that you, you long for us. You cry out for us. You call us by name because you want to spend time with each one of us. You want to speak our identity into us. You want to download strategies from heaven to us. You want to open our, the doors of our destiny for us. You want to bless us. You want to give us shouts of joy. You want to fill our life with abundance. But Lord, we must come. We must humbly come and sit in your presence and give you the space so that you can be the God that does the exceeding abundantly beyond in our life. I thank you for the presence in this room, and I thank you, and I release the hunger. I release hunger that you will hunger and thirst for the things of God, that you will wake up in the wee hours of the morning, and you will be so hungry that you cannot wait to get into the presence of God, and I release grace, grace to be kind to yourself when you don't do it all right, grace to give yourself a second chance and a third chance. Grace to fall asleep in his presence and know that he, he's holding you while you sleep and you're still in his presence and in his presence is fullness of joy. And so, Lord, we thank you for your presence and we just thank you for all that you've done and all that you plan to do. And we pray this in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Riverhouse podcast. For more information, visit riverhouseministries.com.